Well, when we say the word Thanksgiving, I'm sure that most people think turkey. That's, that's most people's definition of Thanksgiving. I mean, you talk to anyone up there and you say, hey, what do you think about Thanksgiving? They're going to tell you, like, man, I love deep fried turkey. I love mashed potato. We're going to go right into the Thanksgiving holiday. But how many know that God has a different definition for Thanksgiving? God has a different interpretation for Thanksgiving. And I'm going to just break down a few verses and I want to just show you just some things on Thanksgiving. Look at 1 Chronicles 16, 34. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is what? Good. Yeah, for he is good, and his love endures forever. Look at Psalm 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And his what? Courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Come on, we got we to gotta thank God that he gave us the name that's above every name. Amen? Here's another one. Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation. It didn't say in some situations. It didn't say in a few situations. It says in every situation. Whatever situation you find yourself in right now, we have to go ahead and learn how to give thanks. He says in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. Present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. How about one more? Psalms 9 verse 1 says this. Lord, I will give thanks to you when I feel like it. <laughs> we tend to live our life many times by how we feel. He says, Lord... I give thanks to you with all my heart, not some of my heart, with everything. I will tell about all the wonderful things you have done. Notice it doesn't says, I will tell about all the horrible things I'm going through. No, he's saying, I will tell of all the awesome things that God has done for my life, in your life, in my children's life, in my family's life. I will talk about, I'm going to brag about God on Thanksgiving Day. Like, what if you went ahead and you went to your table on Thanksgiving? Many people are going to be at tables. What if you just chose to say, you know what I'm thankful for? And you just start telling people what God, where God brought you from, what God got you out of. Whatever it is that God has done for you. And you start having this attitude of Thanksgiving. And when you live a life of advanced thank, Thanksgiving, and when I say advanced, that means that maybe right now you're dealing with something, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally. I don't know what you're facing, but I really believe that God wants us to get to a place where we can have some advanced thanksgiving. In other words, you're already thanking God for your healing before it ever arrives. You're already thanking God for that, that a house, that apartment, that new career, that school money, that you finish the sentence. What if you just started saying, thank you, Father, that it's going to happen. I could see it happening, Father. Thank you, Jesus. What if we started having an attitude of gratitude like that? Like to thank God, not, not, not be stuck in where we're living now, but begin to be thankful for what God can do. Not only be thankful for what God did, but be thankful for what God's about to do in your life. Like super intentional, like, thank you, Father. What's one thing right now you need in your life? What's one thing right now you need in your family, your children? What's one thing, one thing right now? Just think about that one thing. Everybody close your eye. Just think one thing right now. What do you need? And I want you to just pause. And I want you to thank God like he's already doing it right now. Just start thanking him for it. Just thank him right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you for that career. Thank you for that healing. Thank you for that breakthrough. Thank you, Father, for healing so-and-so. Just begin to thank him. Just go ahead, out of your lips, thank him right now in advance. Okay, listen, when you have advanced thanksgiving, you know what you do? You're literally, you are setting yourself up for greater faith. Because that's faith, isn't it? Isn't it calling those things that be not as though they were? That's Thanksgiving right there. It, it also develops perseverance inside of you. 
It also creates opportunities for you. When you start thanking God, like, I don't know how this is all going to work out, God, whatever your situation is, but I thank you, Father God, that you have something so much more amazing, even of what I'm thinking of. Because doesn't God say that I'll do exceedingly, abundantly, above whatever you ask, think, hope, or imagine? Like, what if we just started thanking God like that? It'd be a good stuff. Thank him for your victory already. You may not be having the victory right now, but you start thanking him. Thank you, Lord. I see the victory that I'm going to see in this situation. Are you here tonight? When you're believing for something specific, you thank him before it happens. Just, I can see it, God. God's moved by faith, isn't he? Yeah. Well, Thanksgiving is faith. Okay, so check this out. Um, I started doing some research here. The word thanks is used in the Bible 116 times. 116 times the word thanks. But out of the 116 times that you find the word thanks in this beautiful holy Bible, 73 of those times it says give thanks. 73 times. So you have to ask yourself, how often am I giving thanks to God? Like, have you ever caught yourself, like, I know there's times where I'll wake up in the middle of the night, not often, but when I do, let's say I go to the bathroom, I'll wake up, and you know, you're like half asleep, and you're just like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. You're like, why are you thanking him to go to the bathroom? It just becomes like this attitude of gratitude. You're just like, have you ever been caught yourself just trying to like, thank you, but there's nothing to be thankful for. There's nothing to be thankful for. It's not like God, you know, got you to work extra early, you know, traffic in LA is crazy, right? But you just start thanking God for no reason, right? It's just something that you've developed in your spirit, man, where you're constantly just thanking God. And, and you, you begin to develop that when you come out of the place of complaining and you come to the place of gratitude and you start thanking them for the smallest things. The only way to develop it, those things is begin to remind yourself of some of the things that God has done for you. Like, let's just say this. Like, parents, do you remember when you first had your first child? You were so excited. And I'm sure moms, it was probably painful going through labor pains. And, man, you're just like, ah. But once that baby came out, you're just like, thank you, Jesus. The pain is over, right? And you're like, and then you're happy. You see your baby. Then they grow up, and you're like, what the? Like, they're cute when they're little, but... But what about that moment when you prayed for that job? For some of you, maybe you had a moment where you're just like, man, God, I really need a job. And you've been applying job after job and nothing. And then one day, that one job calls you back and they like you. And they just, there's something unique and special about you. And they end up hiring you and not the three other people that they'd been interviewing. You start saying thank you. Or that time when you purchased that car. And you know you didn't have the credit, maybe. Maybe you didn't have all the money together, but somehow, some way, God made a way in that situation. Or maybe that one time when you, you were maybe renting from somebody, and you wanted your own apartment, and you were just praying, God, I pray that you would open doors for me. And you just kept praying fervently, and, and you were committed, and you saw God. Isn't it amazing how we're committed when we want something from God? And then once you get it, we kind of lose that commitment. Or that first house. Man, I remember our first house that we bought, no way possible in the natural. And so it was like something that we had to believe God for to do something completely supernaturally. And, uh, and of course, we did our part. But then God did his part. And his part was definitely so much bigger than ours. And it was like, thank you, Jesus. I'll never forget the day I got the keys to our first house. It was the most amazing things. Or how about being thankful that, you know what? In that horrible accident that maybe you had. You, you, you probably shouldn't be here right now. You should probably be gone, but you're here. To begin a thing. I remember, do you remember when you had your, I remember when, uh, <clears throat> when you, your car basically flipped how many times? Four times. It was after church. And I remember getting a call uh, from CJ or he called one of our staff members and they said, hey, CJ just got, and out of all places, right in front of the cemetery. I got there, and I literally, his, his car was crushed. And I'm thinking, where is CJ? And he's standing on the side of the road. And I don't think you had any bruises or anything. Just walked, I'm like, thank you, 
Jesus. Just think about those. See, you start thinking about those moments when God delivered you from addiction, whether it was drug addiction, alcohol addiction, anger addiction, negative addiction. That's an addiction today. <laughs> And you just start thank, thank you, Father, that man in that moment. Like driving here tonight, it was interesting. You know what? I was focused just kind of going over my message in my head. And, and I hit something with my front driver, uh, my front side uh, wheel. And my car literally went boop. And it went up. And it, man, it's funny because I'm like going over my star. I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I'm like, thank you, Lord. It freaked me out, man. I almost lost control of my wheel. And it's just those little things that begin to develop a thankful heart. Are you guys with me? So just think about those. How about the meals that you get to eat? Thankful. See, you may, not have, you may not have everything that you want right now, but you have something. You know what? I remember after going through surgery, uh, before, they did the, uh, uh, before they released me from the hospital, they said, you can't leave this after open heart. And they go, you know, when your organs get moved around and stuff like that, things don't tend to always work properly. And they said, until you have a valve movement. You ain't leaving this hospital. I'm like, oh, Lord, please, in the name of Jesus, let there be a vow. And, man, let me tell you something. When that vow moved, thank you, Father God. You are so awesome. I've never been so thankful for a move of the intestines. Amen? I was like, yes, Lord. You know what I'm saying? But you just take for granted those little small things that we have in good health. Being able to breathe being able to walk, being able to speak, being able to put food on your table. You know, being thankful, maybe it's not the car you want, but you have one, right? It may not be the job you like, but you got one. And you start thinking this when you're like, man, thank you, Father. Thank you for my job. I spend more time maybe complaining about my job instead of just saying, thank you, Father, that you've given me the, the, the ability You've given me the capacity, and you've given me the favor at this workplace. Thank you, Jesus, because these people don't have to keep me on. They can let me go anytime they want, but God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's favors on your life. Can we give the Lord a big hand clap for that? I'm laying a little foundation. We haven't even started preaching yet. How about being thankful for being forgiven? Forgiven of our sins, forgiven of our mess-ups, forgiven of our faults, our failures, forgiven the mercy of God, the grace of God. That forgiveness is so powerful. I'm so thankful that, that the Spirit of God, the angel of the Lord, rolled away the, 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 the stone from the tomb, and then Jesus was raised from the dead. I'm so thankful for that. I'm thankful for the cross. Are you thankful for the precious blood of Jesus? You know what? If you have a nosebleed and that blood gets on your shirt, that, that ain't coming off. But you get the blood of Jesus and it says, and it washes every sin away. Man, you got to be thankful for the blood of Jesus. And tonight we're going to take communion. But uh, let me show you now real quickly how, how easy it is to forget what God did. Ready? Numbers chapter 14. We know the story of the children of Israel. They're praying to God. They're petitioning God. You're, have, you're having the Israelites, after 400 plus years, they started losing God. But on the fourth hundred, and I think it's like 430 years, you know, people started going towards God. And they remembered God. And there's something powerful when you remember God in the midst of your brokenness. That God responds, and he responds with a Moses. Moses delivers them out of Egypt. God provides for them through the wilderness in the desert. He feeds them bread. He gives them water from a rock. He gives them a pillar of fire in the night so that they're not freezing cold. Isn't it freezing cold outside? Oh, my God. We're so wimps here in California, huh? Man, it's just, I was like, man, I'm like, this is brutal. But uh, he gave them a pillar of fire to keep them warm. And then when, when, the, when the sun was just blaring on them, he gave them a, uh, clouds to keep them nice and cool. And, and then you know what? And they never had to change their clothes. Their clothes were always in perfect condition. I mean, God provided. Now look at this. Everybody say, but that night. <laughs> There's always one night, huh? But that night, all the members... Uh, the community raised their voices. They wept out loud. Can you imagine 
over probably 14 million Israelites all crying out like babies and just throwing a fit. Look, and the Israelites spoke against Moses and Aaron. The whole community said to them, we wish, be careful what you wish for. We wish we had died in Egypt or even in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land? What land is he talking about? Well, the land of promise. God was trying to give their final destination in the promise of a land with milk and, f- and honey and, and every provision. you. Can. I mean, God was blessing their socks off. He's like, why? Why do we even have to go to this land? We're going to be killed by swords. Our enemies will capture our wives and children. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? I mean, you've been a slave for 430 years, and you'd rather go back to Egypt than to be in the presence of Almighty God? The God who split the Red Sea and, and literally destroyed your enemy? That's the place you'd rather go back? They said to one another, we should choose another leader. We should go back to Egypt. In other words, these people were so unthankful. They weren't, thank- they weren't even grateful for the things that God had shown them. Like so many of us, there's, some, there's, there's moments in our life where it's so easy to come back to this place of only seeing the moment and not seeing all of the wonderful seasons and moments and 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 situations and circumstances where God showed up and you and I can agree and say we've all said this thank God showed up at the I mean he he's never on time but he's never late right and when we say he's never on time we're talking about our timetable but God's never late he always shows up and and they're not even willing to celebrate the fact that God has a plan for them God has a future for them. God has a purpose for them. But they're living in their moment of just seeing the worst of the worst. I mean, they're now complaining about their leader, Moses. They're complaining about their shepherd. They're complaining about the ones that have literally been having an ear to heaven and getting direction from God. And they're not liking this. Now look how they respond. Numbers 14, verse 5 and 10. We'll skip down. It says that Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly gathered there. In other words, man, they're just like overwhelmed with everybody's complaining. And the only thing they could do was not, and I'm glad, and I think this is a good teaching moment for us. You know, be careful when you complain. Never surround yourself with people when you complain that all they do is hear you and say, you know what? Yeah, I can see why you're feeling that. Don't get with people that are going to agree with you. Get with people that are going to tell you, hey, you know what? I, I think you're just seeing this wrong right now. Yeah, I, I, think, I think, you know what? You, you probably let that situation hurt you a little bit too much. Um, but that's not who you are. Don't get, don't get around people that are going to agree with you. I'm glad that Moses, Joshua, and Caleb didn't sit there and start crying with them. They, they, they fell face down. They were overwhelmed, and they didn't know what to do with all the cries, but they knew one thing to do. We're going to see God in this moment. We need Jesus right now in this moment. And so they, they're, they're calling out to God, and let's keep reading. Uh, and it says, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes that's how crazy this was. I mean, when, they, when, they, when, you, when you tear your clothes in biblical times, that's because, man, you're in this place of like, God, we need you. Have you ever just felt like a roar, like, like that incredible Hulk feeling? You just want to rip yourself out of your flesh? You ever felt that way? Anybody? Or am I the only one? Okay. And you're like, ah, I can't. And, and it, look, and said to the entire Israelites assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. So here they're being negative, complaining, murmuring. And what do they do? They combat that with what? Future. They combat that with vision. They combat that with purpose. When you lose sight of vision, you become a great complainer. When you lose sight, when you lose focus, listen, what you focus on expands. What you focus on grows 
And so what did they do? They started focusing. They went right back to God's vision. Well, hey, check this out. We already went. We checked out the land. It's legit. It's real. What God said is exactly what he said. We saw the milk. We saw the honey. We saw big, giant grapes. We saw everything that God said. And they're trying to explain this to, to them. And it says, and the land we passed through was explored, and it's good. And, and if the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into the land. If the Lord is what? pleased with us if the lord is what pleased with us so if you're constantly complaining are you pleasing or displeasing if you're constantly complaining will you ever get to the promised land if you're always murmuring will you ever get to the promised land no you won't and we're going to break that down in scripture you won't get there but aren't you glad for Jesus, the one who gives us the mercy and the grace. And let me tell you why. Because in this story, if you read the, the, the whole story, God was ready to whack them. Let me, let me show you. And so a land flowing with milk and honey and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against who? The Lord. Listen, the only thing, don't rebel. Come on, you, you can be ungrateful or you can be thankful. He says, and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them, but the whole assembly talked about stoning them. Man, they wanted to give them a beatdown. They're bringing vision. Watch out who you hang with. Seriously. Man, get around some visionaries. Get around some people that bring you back to Jesus, who bring you back to vision, who bring you back to earth, who bring you back back to life and say you know what i know this is your moment but it's a moment it's temporary it's not forever be grateful for this moment because this moment is going to be the stepping stone for your next season amen you're going to learn something amazing out of this moment and the glory of the lord appeared at the tent of the meeting to all the israelites you better be careful when the lord appears another version the original version says and god came down <laughs> And God came down. But he wasn't coming down for a nice conversation. God came down because he heard what Moses, Joshua, and Caleb told him. They Listen, Moses didn't complain with the people. Moses brought his complaint to God and started telling God, this is what your people are saying about us. This is what your people are saying about you. And the Bible says, and the Lord or God came down. He came down, and, um, and when he came down, uh, God was ba basically saying, uh, how, long will these people, how long will they complain? How long will they murmur? How long will they not believe me? How long will I put up with them? I mean, you read through, and then as God is like going through this whole spiel, like it's all in there. Moses, Caleb, they, they're, they're now starting to remind God of his grace, of his mercy, of, of, of his, his, his fame that's been going out all throughout Israel of his goodness of bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, destroying the enemy. And basically, this is pretty amazing because here you have two, three godly men that are basically encouraging God saying, hey, I probably wouldn't whack him, God. Probably not, good, not a good idea to kill him. Isn't that amazing how God will love, he loves to speak with us. He's just so real. That's why our mission here is, 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 is helping people connect with the real God. Right? We want you to connect with the real God. But in Numbers 14, 28, this is what God tells them. Word for word, he says, and as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In other words, God said, let me give them what they asked for. Let me go ahead and give them what, they're, what they want. They're saying, just let us die here. God's like, okay, let's go ahead and give you what you asked for. Not, it's not, God didn't, listen, it wasn't God's idea to kill them. It was their idea to get killed. It wasn't God's dream to kill them. It wasn't God's dream. Listen, we choose our own grave. We choose it. We choose whether or not we're going to push forward. We choose whether we're going to keep complaining. We choose whether we're going to keep murmuring. These are things that we choose. And if you think about it, complaining 
is sin. I know that we always think about big sins, right? Right? You think about every possible sin, the big dogs, but no one really ever thinks about complaining is a sin. If you're always murmuring, complaining, bickering, slandering, talking, that's sin. Let me give you the, one of the original definitions of sin. Because anything that is not faith is sin, right? So the word complain means this. It means to stay overnight or to remain. Think about this. It means to stay overnight or to complain. How many years did the Israelites stay in the wilderness? 40 years. Divide 40 years times 365 days in a year. That's 14,600 days of having an overnight stay. And the Bible says, and they died in the wilderness. You start thinking about, I wonder how much complaining. Now, we all have a little bit of complaining in us. Don't get me wrong. Okay, like I complain sometimes like, man, we had all these people and we have no room. And I can get so stuck on the, what I don't have. We don't have enough space. We don't have enough children's room. We don't, I can get stuck there. But I have to remind myself, but thank you, Father, that we have a building where we can meet. Thank you, Lord, that not just this, but thank you, Lord, that we have the building across the street where we meet. To pay the bills across the street where we meet. Thank you, Lord, every month. Thank you. It ain't always easy, but thank you, Jesus, that you provide. And it's like getting yourself out of that, that, that road of complaint. Just complain. Because if not, I'm just going to keep spending the night there. And you're delaying your promise. You're going to delay it. And so, so often we're thinking, God, where are you? Well, we spend all our time not praying prayers of faith. We've been praying prayers of complaint. Where's my man? Where's my woman? I haven't seen him. I'll, I'll give you a famous one. Uh, Pastor, i got to change churches because I can't find my man here. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> oh, <this is> for real. <laughs> Ever say what I focus on? It grows. Yeah, it does. I mean, we, we all have a little bit of complaint in us. But there's a difference between a lifestyle of complaining and moments of complaining. It's a big difference. I know people that my God, I don't even like being around them because I know the moment I, how you doing? I'm like, oh, you know, you leave exhausted when you leave their presence. You don't leave inspired. You don't leave empowered. You don't leave excited. You know, you don't, you, you want to, you want to be able to, now I get it. There's moments where people do come and they, they're complaining about something, but it's not like, it's not their character. It's just a moment of complaining. But when it's like one complaint after another complaint after, it's like, oh, my God, sister complain, brother complain, you know, you, I, it, it, just, it just sucks the life out of you. It really does. And I get it because when you think about this or when you think about the grace of God, what we deserved, we deserve. What those Israelites deserved, they deserved it. Can we all agree to that? They did. But aren't you glad what we deserved, God, uh, he, he, he reversed on us. He reversed it through his son, Jesus. When you think about the reversing power of God, how God can change a heart if you're willing to let him. And so David is another perfect example. He did it the right way. David would always, if you read all throughout the book of Psalms, man, he was always like, you know, my enemies are after me. It, it almost seemed like he was complaining. And he would say things, you know, like, you know, God, you've left me. God, you've forgotten me. God, where are you? But he always ended, but God, you're faithful. But God, you're good. But God, you can turn the situation around. But God, you're greater than this situation. Every single, read the book of Psalms. You'll always see it. You'll see David. But notice this. David didn't complain with his people. David didn't complain with his leadership. David didn't complain with anyone but God. We are good at complaining with people. That's called murmur. Right? 
You complain like, oh my God, can you believe what they did? Can you believe pastor? Oh my God, he's doing family throne night again. Oh my gosh. Oh my God, can you believe? He's, that's the devil's night. You know what I'm saying? Are you kidding me? Did you see his new jacket? Is that what he's doing with my money? Is that what he's, he got a new job. Is that what he did with my money? It's cute and funny, right? But it's the truth. Come on, you do that at work. Right? You go and get with the other person. Oh, you, can you believe his decision? We know what to do. He doesn't. He just gets paid the big money because he's a good people person. But we're the workers. We know how to work this bad boy. And so we can begin to get this, this attitude of complain and murmuring. And before you know it, we're not, we're not complaining before God. God does, listen, God allows us to complain with him. But when you start getting in the murmuring and the complaining with other people that are not leading you back to God, now you have a problem. That's where you have to really, if you missed Sunday's message, go back and listen to it. Because we talked about being full of wisdom, right? So we need to learn how to develop a thankful heart. All of us have caught ourselves being a little murmur or complaining. All of us have. Nobody gets away with it. But remember, there's lifestyle. Like that's who you are. That would suck to be known as the complainer. If people walk away from you, you probably won. You see you in the hallway and they're like, woo. <laughs> like, hey, no, I got to go to the bathroom. You know, it, you know there's a problem. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Check yourself. But how many know that God constantly shows his unfailing love? His grace and his mercy. But we can be so quick to complain for not getting the job we wanted, for not getting the car we wanted. And we just start being so ungrateful, so unthankful, and not just say, you know, thank you, Father, because you blessed me with something. You did something for me. They just wanted God to do everything. He, they got so used to. They felt so entitled. God fed them. God gave them drink out of a rock. God gave them pillows. God did everything for them, but it's almost like they didn't want to do anything for themselves. Even when they got the promised land, even when God allowed them, he showed them, look, he gave them a, literally a, a walkthrough. He had an open house. And the children of Israel, 12 tribes, 12 leaders of the tribes went and walked in and they saw everything. And still, when they were trying to cast the vision. They wanted to stone Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. They wanted to kill them. Why? They wanted everything free in 99. They wanted no sacrifice. They didn't want to work hard for it. They just had this, this entitlement. This, like, you owe me, God. How many know that God doesn't owe us anything? See, here's a better question. If God never did one more thing for you ever again, would he still be God to you? That's, I mean, if God never did one more thing for you, would he still be God? Or is he only God when he does good things for us? Something to think about, huh? But to be thankful for everything he's done for us. And I get it. Listen, we all have areas in our life where it's been hard and... You can, we can all, you know, sell our story, share our story, tell our story, and we can talk about how bad it was and how bad it is. And, and, and listen, and I'm not trying to be mean hard or anything, but let me tell you something. We all have a part of our life that's not the greatest. All of us have a hard moment in our life, every single person here in this room, somewhere in some area of your life. And here's what I started thinking about. Okay, well, I really believe that there's people inside this room and there's people outside of this church that have it just a little bit harder than I do right now. For example, I know two people right now that are fighting for their life in hospitals. Right now as we speak. 
people posting, not from this church, people posting, people that we know, asking for a miracle on Thanksgiving week. And it's not that we don't, we don't, we don't care about or God doesn't care about our moment, but sometimes we can become so entitled to our story that we defend it. And then, we can't ex- and then we expect God to heal us, but we're too busy defending it. So we're no different than the Israelites. They were defending their own feelings about the situation. And God's like, look, I have a future for you. Look, I have a purpose for you. Look, I have a land filled with milk and honey. Look, I have, I have some, And we just, we just won't accept it. Have you all been there before? All been there before. So we can lose our thanksgiving when we forget the grace and not realize that God always has a plan for our setbacks, for our low tides, for our high tide. Like God always has a plan. He had a plan for them. Think about it. When you think about uh, Joseph, man, Joseph, God gave him a dream. And he was 17 years old when he got this dream. Remember he told him that he would be like one of the, the, the governor's of Egypt, but then what happens to him? He gets sold by his brothers. So now he's, he's in the pit. Then they come and, and he gets sold. Now he's in the house. Then he is falsely arrested for uh, committing adultery, which he never did. Now he's in prison. He spent 14 years in prison. He gets forgotten in prison. So just, just let's count the years Probably, probably over 20 years before Joseph ever saw the dream. But how did he keep an attitude of gratitude? How did he not get bitter? Thanksgiving. Read, if you read the whole story of, of Joseph, nowhere there do you see him complaining to God. He had moments where he was hurt and he was asking God, but he wasn't complaining to people about his situation. He was just, he was quietly internalizing things with God. But God got him through it, and he saw the dream. Because we, we, a lot of us, we want microwave dreams. You know what I'm saying? We want that bad boy to pop. We don't like, remember, remember back in the days when we used to cook popcorn? You had to put it in the pan, and shh, And then the microwave came, and like, what the? It's like, like in two minutes, man. It's like, what in the world? You know, microwave. That's, I think, how we want God to package the dream and then put it in the microwave. father's dinner table you have that communion cup in your hand and I want us to remember tonight everything that God has done for us the smallest little things and to sit at his table and do what Jesus said he says and when you take this he says remember me in this do you remember when you first got saved Remember how exciting that was? Do you still have that same excitement? Do you still feel a passion for the things of God? Or have you felt like life has just taken that from you? You got to be reminded, the Bible says, and nothing can separate you from the love of God, nor death, nor powers, nor principalities, nor rulers. of Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Let me prove it to you. Here you see Peter messes up. Let's see how good you know your Bible. How did Peter mess up after uh, Jesus was crucified? Let's see. Anybody out there? Let's engage. How did he mess up? He denied Jesus. Three, not once. Three. And he cussed. And he cussed. And now he's in a moment where he's at the table. say he's at the table. He's at the table about to have a meal with Jesus. And Jesus is having a conversation with him like he's going to have with you and me tonight. And in John 21, verse 15, 17, here's the conversation at the table. And when Jesus and the disciples had finished eating, 
Jesus spoke to Simon Peter, so he pulled him aside. And he said, Peter, come here, let me talk to you. Andrea, let me talk to you. He asked Simon, thank you. He said, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? That would throw me back. How about you? Do you love me more than these others do? Do you love me more than everybody at Elevate Church? It's basically what he was saying. He said, yes, Lord, he answered. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs. Again, Jesus asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, then take care of my sheep. Then Jesus spoke to him a third time. How many times did he deny him? How many times is he asking him now? You know what God's doing? He's turning what he deserved and he reversed it and showing him grace and mercy. And Jesus spoke to him a third time. He asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter felt bad. He felt condemnation. He felt guilt. He felt shame. He felt worthless. He felt no good. He felt disgusting. He felt dirty. He felt unworthy. He felt like he's not good enough. He felt like he's not, he shouldn't even be sitting at the table. He felt all these feelings like so many of us. We feel unworthy, dirty, condemned, guilty, shame. And sometimes we can wake up with this feeling daily but Jesus is sitting at the table having a conversation and three times he's asking him, I just want to know, do you love me? And it wasn't just, yes, Lord, I love you. And it was a pause. No, he said, then go and feed my sheep. Tend my sheep. Immediately he's saying, get back to work. Get back to serving. Because condemnation will keep you for, from doing anything for God because your shame is just tells you I'm not good enough so this is a story of condemnation this is a story of shame because of sin this is a story of feeling a complete sense of worthlessness or unworthy and I love how he finishes this he says Lord you know all things in other words only you, you know me. Only you know my heart. I'm telling you I love you, but obviously I can't prove it to you. Because obviously, let's look at my past. Let's look at what I did. Let's look at my failure. Let's look at my falling. I denied you, but only you know. Only you know, God, okay, because I can't prove this to you. I'm telling you I love you, but I can't prove it to you. And he says, you know all things. Say it with me. You know all things. Aren't you glad that God knows every single thing about you right now? He knows. He knows you. He knows you. He says, you know all things. You know that I love you, Jesus said. Jesus said, feed my sheep. That means that Jesus was trying to show Peter. He was trying to explain to Peter that I am greater than your condemnation, Peter. I'm greater than your shame. I'm greater than your feeling of not, not feeling like you're worth my love, like you don't deserve it. Listen, even when we deserved the worst, God still gave his best. Aren't you thankful for that? He's focusing on this. He says, you know all things. Jesus knows that we want to get our heart right. Jesus knows that we want to get closer to him. Jesus knows that we want to change our life. And I think sometimes shame is what keeps us from the change. But the only question Jesus has for us this Thanksgiving is, but do you love me? He's not asking you, can you work for me again? He's not asking you for anything else other than, do you love me? 
and we know that the Bible says that then Jesus restored, restored, the scripture says he restored Peter again. And that's, that's good news because that means that if God can restore Peter, then that means God can restore us. From being a complainer, from failure, from anything, God can restore, God can redeem. 